dark when the healer flicked aside her curtain and let them in. Rump manoeuvred her younger brother's limp body over the threshold and stepped into the hut. It was small, almost as small as the shack Runt and her brother shared at the top of the hill. Tech work swung from the low wooden ceiling, glinting shards of metal and glass. The healer herself sat at the back of the hut, stirring a large pot of stew and humming. She was an ancient thing, with dirt in the folds of folded wrinkles of her face and nails as long as claws. My brother's got the river sickness, Runt said. Can you help him? The healer looked up and heaved a great sigh. She let her eyes slide over Z's body. Runt knew what she saw, a boy of 10, scarcely a bag of bones now, his brown skin tinged yellow, his breath shallow and fast. It was a hot evening, but the film of sweat that covered Dee's body had nothing to do with the weather. Besides, he was shivering, and in those rare moments when he was lucid, he kept repeating that he was cold, so very cold. Tricky, the healer said, shuffling over. Pelana, that was her name. Runt remembered it now. Don't you never go to old Pilana, Ma used to say. She's the worst of the lot and as likely to kill you as to heal you. But Runt had no choice. She tried, tried veiled Aya over by the docks, but she had said the best Runt could do for her little brother now was make him comfortable. Sutesh near Arant Hill had sucked their teeth and shaken their head. Baba Aishan had actually shed a tear when Runt had arrived on the doorstep of his townhouse. He'd sent Runt away with a bundle of herbs to brew up for the pain. Very tricky, Pelana said, touching Z lightly with the back of one filthy hand. She lifted her eyes to Runt. I've got the goods to heal him, she said. Ain't gonna be cheap though. Runt chewed at her lip. Can I owe you? My word's my honour, I swear. The old woman chuckled. Words your honour, is it? How old are you, girl? Twelve? Thirteen? Runt tried not to let her irritation show. I'm eighteen, she said. People always took her for younger than she was, on account of her small frame. Two sons, Pilana said. You'll need to get it to me tonight. Runt closed her eyes, willing away the panic. I've got half a moon, she said. That's all my money in the world. Please, can I just owe you? Pilana eyed her warily before sighing and saying, look, tell you what, you leave him here. I'll make sure he doesn't get no worse, promise. You go and sort out the money. Two sons, tonight. That's the best I can do. A rush of anger stole over Runt then, and she had to clench her fists to stop herself from flying at the woman. Deep within her, she felt a stir, as she always had since her bubba had given her the pendant. You're its guardian, girl, its keeper. See that nothing happens to it, you hear? And whatever you do, don't use it on your brother. I'll get you your money, Runt said, pushing to her feet. She was almost at the strip of material that marked Pilana's door when she stopped and added, but I'm telling you, if he dies, I'll burn this place down with you inside. I work for the Chendu family, you know. Pilana's chuckles followed her out into the night. It was fully dark when Runt stepped out onto the mud of the road everyone called Low Hill. The stirring within her grew more insistent, and before she knew it, the voices of the pendant were bubbling up inside her, filling her mind with their overlapping chatter. We could heal him, fix him, make him better. No, Runt said. Baba said no. Nobody would know. Nobody would care. Just him. Just your brother. Runt clenched her fist and cursed her father's name for the hundredth time that day. Why? Why had Bubba returned after so many years just to give her a piece of tech work she couldn't use and then disappear again into the night? Its weight bumped against her skin beneath the linen of her tunic because the pendant was tech work. That much, uh, she knew that much and tech work of the rarest sort. Outwardly, it looked like little more than a wooden carving an ugly thing of overlapping faces all leering out. But Bubba said it was special, said she was special as its keeper. Rump wondered why the man who hadn't seen her since Z was in their Ma's belly thought he knew her well enough to trust her with something of such importance. And at the time she decided Bubba was placating her, 
had just given her a worthless trinket to make up for all the years of absence. Then he had brought two of his friends to her, told her to hold her hands over them while she wore the pendant. She'd watched as he jerked his knife across their palms, calm as you please. Runt hadn't flinched, her bubba didn't like flinchers, and afterwards he'd whispered, go on, tell the pendant to heal them. And she had, and it had. That had been moons ago now, before the pendant had started talking to her. We can heal him, fix him, make him better. Bubba had told her the faces in the pendant might speak to her, said it was a rare kind of healing tech work that talked. Pay him no mind, her Bubba told her. Shut him out if you can, but on no account, no matter what you, they promise you, are you to do anything they say. Runt rounded the corner and there stood the Cascade Inn, a beacon of light in the darkness, looming above the shacks of the Lord's Grave Shanty. She was already late for her shift, had actually been considering never showing up again. The pay was scarcely enough to keep her and Z in bread, and she was sick of the sight of dirty pots. Besides, she was destined for greater things. Bubba always said so. You're late, you lazy shit, Asham said as she descended the narrow steps into the pot room. You're lucky I ain't giving your job to someone else. My brother's sick, Runt said, crossing the uneven tiled floor to take her place at the largest wash bucket. Course he bloody is, Asham said before throwing a dishcloth at her head and turning back to chopping yam. Asham was a moody, temperamental sort, and most of the youths who worked in the kitchens spent their lives tiptoeing around his changeable ways. As Runt set to work on the heavy stew pots, she watched Asham out of the corner of her eye, waiting for her moment. It came after Asham had had his break and was laughing at something Cessa, the girl who works the ovens, had said. I need a favour, Runt said, putting on her most winning smile as Asham swept back to his mountain of vegetables. I know I ain't due pay till Sun's day, but I wondered, are you asking for an advance on your pay? Because you ain't gonna get it. My brother's sick. You deaf? I said, no, now get to work. Runt turned back to her bucket, her face hot with anger. The cascade was in full swing above, the sound of singing and drums reverberating through the ceiling. The laughter and shrieks of merriment grew louder as the evening wore on and Runt's mood grew darker. But the plan was beginning to form in her mind. She might not be able to use the pendant to heal, but that didn't mean she couldn't, it couldn't serve her purpose. Finally, near midnight, he appeared. Ket, the man Runt had been waiting for. You got my usual charm, Ket said, lumbering down the stairs. He was a portly soul, dressed immaculately in, the embro in embroidered silks. Runt hadn't worked out exactly what he did for the Chengdu family, but it was something to do with trading tech work. Of course, my friend, Asham said, reaching for one of the shelves. This was it, her last chance for Z. Excuse me, Ket, Runt said. I wanted to show you something. Ket froze part way up the stairs as though someone had struck him and turned slowly. And just who are you to use my name, he said. She's the pot girl, Asham said. Don't pay her no mind. What are you doing, Runt? Get back to work. Six years. That was how long Runt had been working there. Six years and she saw Ket almost daily. I've got something special to sell you. You trade tech work, right? Look at this. Runt was fumbling with the pendant when Asham reached her and began manhandling her back to her pots. It's rare, Runt called over Asham's shoulder. I'm sorry, Ket, Asham said. Don't know what's got into this idiot, but it won't be forgotten. He shot Runt a look. Wait a minute, Ket said, holding up a jeweled hand. Come here, girl. Asham narrowed his eyes at Runt, but let his hands drop. Runt slipped past him and returned to the foot of the sta stairs. Here, she said, pulling the tech work out from beneath her tunic, and letting it dangle from one finger. Very rare. My bubba got it from across the ocean. Ket leaned forwards and peered at it through his stu tiny, stupid eyes. He lifted it with one finger and Runt tried not to wrinkle her nose. The man smelled like powder and perfume, but beneath it all was stale sweat, the stale sweat of a weak man. But Runt could see from the way his jaw tightened that he was interested, very interested. I'll give you a moon for it, Ket said with a shrug. A moon? It's worth three dozen suns at least. 
but I'll settle for 10. 10, Ket laughed. I told you, a moon. Runt thought of Z shivering on the floor of Polana's hut and gritted her teeth. Five suns then, but I can't go no lower. Can't go no lower, Ket laughed, glancing over at Asham, who laughed too. Listen, you little shit, Ket said, looking back at Runt. You're lucky to get a moon for it. I've met hundreds of souls like you, brats who think the world owes them something. Well, the world don't owe you nothing. You take what you're served, one moon. But it's priceless, my baba said. My baba said, listen to her, said Ket. I don't care about your filthy beggar of a father. If I say it's worth a moon, it's worth a moon. Just who do you think you are? My baba ain't no beggar, Runt said, the heat rising in her again. Without warning, Ket jerked his finger, snapping the length of string the pendant hung from. Then he kicked out with one meaty leg, sending Runt staggering backwards and into a pile of plates. Crockery clattered all around her as she hit the ground. Here you go, you ungrateful whelp, Ket said. One moon. The coin spun through the air, glinting before landing at Runt's feet. Runt was still trying to write herself when Ket went stomping up the stairs with her father's tech work. And that's the end.